some of you are finished, uh, at least with the programming for Lab 3A, is that what it is? And that's great. Um, some of you are not. Those of you who are, I encourage you to check out Piazza and answer questions for people who are still having issues. Because there are a lot of things to go wrong, or a lot of picky things to get right, is maybe another way to look at it. Okay? I will try to be participating, and I will be there after, cl after class today for an hour uh, in the lab. Um, but you know, I go to bed way before midnight uh, tonight and tomorrow night, so you all would be helpful. All right. So we were talking about the alarm uh, and interrupts on Monday. And I just wanted to go over again, because I'm not sure I was, I was as clear as I wanted to be, about this idea of putting a return address on the stack. So let's say we're here. We're in Maine. Okay, we've, set it, we've, we've registered an alarm. So our periodics can be called every so often. And we're just happily going along in Maine. And we got some instruction like move zero into AX or something, right? So it's got a particular stack. We got particular values of registers. And then out of nowhere, we get an interrupt. What kind of interrupt do we get? Anyone? To timer. We get a timer interrupt. So we do not execute this. We save our EIP, right? We save our ESP. We save all these other things on the, tra on the trap frame. And we're now in our trap code on a kernel stack. Part of what's on here is the, the trap frame itself, right? So we have the trap frame is actually on here. So we've got inside this trap frame, EIP and ESP and so on. We want to go run periodic. Right, so periodic is, let's say, here. And this is where we want to start executing. We talked about why we don't want to just directly call it and about the unfortunate fact that that almost works. Right? We can go in there, but then we're, kernel, we're in kernel mode running user code. Not a good, not a good thing. So. The way we do it is we modify the EIP in the trap frame so that when it returns, it returns not to this code where we left it, but instead to this code. Now notice one thing. If we overwrite the EIP here, this is the only place we were keeping track that this is where we were in our main program. If we overwrite it, it's gone. We no longer know where to return to in main. And now, when we go into periodic, so first off, when we go into the user stack, let's see. The user stack will be just what it was when we left main. We start executing periodic, and what happens when we get to the end? We're going to execute a, a return call. Return pops an EIP off the stack. What EIP is on the top of the stack here? Or what is on the top of the stack? Exactly. Who knows? Who knows, right? Whatever main happened to have there. And when we return, it won't be a fun place. Probably, it'll be zero. And if it's a zero, guess where that is? In XV6, that says, let's start main, right? So we need to ensure that when we call periodic, we have on the top of the stack a return address to go back to. And where? This one. So we're going to put this. Let's see if I can do We're going to put this EIP here on the top of the stack and ignore the fact that it's less than zero. Okay? So then when we run periodic and we go into go and now we do return, it says pop that off the stack. We go back and we go back right back to here and we continue on our merry way. And that is what this code is doing. We're saving some space on which stack? The stack we're executing right now? No, this is the kernel stack we're running on. We want to save space in the user stack. And the user stack is referenced here, saved in the trap frame. So that's why we decrement it by four to make space and then move the old EIP onto there. 
So it's now on the stack, and then when we return from periodic, we'll go back to it. Does that make sense? Joe. Yep, we're directly manipulating user stack space, and that's why it's important for this ex instruction right here that our page directory is a page directory that includes those user mappings because we're writing into user space. If it were strictly a kernel page directory, this wouldn't work. Questions on that? Okay. Other things you can get wrong. Uh, what if you didn't check for CPL3? So I don't know if you remember, but we had this check that says if we have a procedure, right, a, a current um, yeah, procedure running, and we're in user mode, then we do this. And so what happens if we're not is the following. In each one, you get to sort of diagnose what actually goes wrong. So what happens is we get an unexpected trap at this instruction. And the nice thing is whenever we get this EIP, we go to the assembler, associated assembler file, and we can find what instruction it is. Right? We don't have to use GDB. We can just use Vim or Emacs. Um, and 801.0.5.1.7.D is this line here, which is moving a value, basically moving EIP into the ESP. The indirect from the ESP. And I'll give you a hint. This is not the user stack. Okay? Why isn't this the user stack? Again, anyone? Yeah, well, this only fails when the permission level actually is zero. Yeah. So if we came from permission level zero, this is not a user stack, because this records the old stack. Well, right on? if you don't, if the CPL doesn't decrease, then the doesn't push any SPL. Uh, that's a good point. The CPL didn't decrease. So we did, we're going from zero to zero, right? We were executing in the kernel, and we got a timer interrupt, and therefore, the, the processor said, I don't need to save the stack pointer because I'm not switching stacks. So therefore, what's this value? Whatever happens to be there on the stack, which is garbage. So that's why we get this error. Okay. So a lot, of, again, as I said on Monday, a lot of ways you can get stuff wrong. Um, the alarm callback is important at that point to kernel code. I think we actually correctly deal with that. When you call arg pointer to try and pull a pointer off the stack, there's code that validates that that pointer <coughs> points into the user's space. So this, uh, our code handles this correctly as long as using arg pointer. If you used arg int, the only difference between arg int and arg pointer is they both pull a four byte value from the stack. Arg pointer checks to make sure it's in the range. Yeah. But um, for that callback, it's called from user code, though, right? So it's not going to be able to read the kernel code anywhere. So we are returning, okay. All right, let's put a different question in. You're right. Um, the way this works is we'll get a protection violation when we do an IRET, because it'll come back with an IRET. It'll pop the EIP off the stack. The IP will point into kernel code, but we're in user mode, and it doesn't have access to the kernel code, so we'll get in there. But we do still have a vulnerability. So the vulnerability is what if ESP, the stack pointer, points to kernel code. Now, well, kernel space, let's just say. Is this possible, Julius? Can a user program set up the stack pointer to point to <coughs> kernel space? OK, agreed. Sarah, let's say a user program sets the stack pointer to point into kernel space. Can the user program read or write from that kernel space? 
No, not as useful. So they can set the stack pointer, they just can't actually use it. But you can imagine this nefarious user program that sets it. What is this code right here going to do? We decrement it. That's no problem. But then what do we do here? We're writing into, we're writing into a pointer that the user has given us that we have not validated while we're in kernel mode. We never want to do that. So we really need to verify that ESP is within the user range. Does that make sense? Because otherwise you're saying, I can force the kernel to write an almost arbitrary value, right, the instruction pointer, because I can basically write a code that loops at some particular instruction that I want. Right, just keeps going back, so I know that value. And I can set the stack pointer to a value I want. So all I really need to do is set an alarm, set my stack pointer to point to a place in the kernel, <coughs> jump to some particular location that has an EIP that, is, that I want to be writing, loop there, just branch back to it, and then eventually the alarm goes off, and this code will write four bytes of my choosing, or roughly of my choosing, into any place in the kernel I asked it to. Is that a security hole? Yes. Does that make sense? OK. Uh, Drew. Wait, sorry. Uh, just that point. So how can the user uh, uh, for the stack point to give a value to the kernel just by they, You can move a value into the stack pointer. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. You, you know you can add to a stack pointer. So yeah, just, just set it. So. And you really have to think very defensively, right? Just, just not what should the stack pointer be. It should be the user stack. What could this value be? Okay. Periodic's running. So we got an interrupt. Our alarm went off. We're running periodic. And now, so we're inside periodic. <coughs> and let's say periodic is a little bit slow. And now we get another interrupt. while we're in the middle. What should we do? Well, we could call periodic again, I guess. And in fact, that's what our code will do. And it'll go back in. And so if you were in the middle of writing here, then you'll get new writing that happens. And then we return. Where do we want to return to? Oh, we'll return to where we got interrupted, which is here. <coughs> And then this will return from where it got interrupted to here. So we'll have two return locations on the stack, one back in the main and one to the period that got interrupted. And if that second one got interrupted, then we'd have three and so on. If you didn't want that, it requires some work to make sure that we're not calling um, the alarm handler if we're already in the middle of alarm handler. Is it easy to know when we're in the alarm handler? We kind of know that if this is where we're returning to with our EIP, that we'll be in the alarm handler. But how do we know when the alarm handler finishes? It's, it's, it's not real clear. We're going to have to add some code that runs after the alarm handler, right, the periodic, in order to tell the kernel we're done servicing this alarm. So we'll need to have a system call to communicate back to the kernel. And we'll need to insert more code. So instead of returning here to where we got interrupted, we need to return to some little code that we add that calls back into the kernel. And then when it's done, it goes back. So it would be some work there. Right where do you put that code? On the stack. The, the tricky place is put it on the user stack, right? So you can ar arrange things so you go execute that code and then you pop back out to the right place. Because you don't really have any other place. Yeah, As the kernel, you can, you can put stuff. Uh, is it a problem if periodic mo modifies registers? So uh, 
We have scratch registers. Uh, Ishan, so what's an example scratch register? That is a register that when you call a function, it's allowed to use it and not restore it. Yeah, yeah EAX is a good example. So what if periodic modifies EAX? Well, if we were just in the middle, we're just about to execute. So let's say main looks like move, I don't know, 3 to EAX, and then move, what is this, percent? And then move percent EAX to percent EDX. And we get interrupted right between these two. So what's in EAX? 3. What do we want to be in EAX when we come back? 3. But if we call periodic, well, I mean, we don't realize even we're calling periodic, but we call periodic, periodic is it's just a C function. And it says I can blow EAX if I want to. It so happens periodic doesn't right now, but it could. So we really want to add even more code that before we call periodic, we save registers, and after we call it, we restore registers. We don't. Okay, so I take it back. We do have access to those registers. So we could go copy the <coughs> registers we need to save into the stack and then add code to pop them back off the stack. Or we could just add code to move the values onto the stack, right? We don't have to go into the trap frame and grab them because we know when periodic starts running, the values will be what they were. And so we could have code that just moves the values of the registers. So, uh, interrupt, and this is, we're going to talk about this as far as multiprocessors and locking today. But interrupts can happen between any two instructions. Uh, there's an unless. Unless, Nandika, what? Yeah, unless we've disabled interrupt. Okay, so other code, arbitrary code, can run between those instructions. Lots and lots of code could run. With user code, it's not so bad. We have to be okay if we called alarm with knowing that periodic can be run. And the nice thing is we started that. We're the ones that started that. Or if we create multiple threads, that's going to cause between any two instructions this can happen. In the kernel, <coughs> it could be a big issue. I mean, we know interrupts are happening. And so we need to be aware of when interrupts are happening. And we may need to turn on and off interrupts appropriately. So if we have a critical section of code that we don't want an inter interrupt handler to run in, we have to set the interrupt flag. And then when we're done with that critical section, clear the interrupt flag. And I believe I have those, the right meaning of those. I think if this one is one, that means no interrupt. But before you ship your code, like look that up. Um, I mentioned the idea of polling, that you can write a device driver that just goes to the device, right, via its memory mapped I.O., and you know, asks whether it's ready and you can continually ask whether it's ready. Right? That's the polling. There are some cases where polling is better than interrupt. Interrupts have an overhead, all right? like around one microsecond. We've got a save and restore state, so there's instructions that are running. And some devices can generate interrupts faster than you can handle, like gigabit ethernet. So what you can do is have a device driver that modulates itself. If the interrupts are coming in fast and furious, it switches to polling mode. And if they come in not so quickly, it switches back to interrupt mode. Because okay. interrupt mode is nice, because if nothing's happening, it doesn't cost you anything. Where polling, you are paying a price. So either one of them could be wasting CPU time. If you've if, if you're got like a keyboard, Polling would be wasting CPU time. If you've got gigabit ethernet, 
then you could be wasting CPU time just by the overhead of the interrupts. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so this leads us fairly naturally into threading. So we're going to talk about the homework six, the locking, lock abstraction and deadlocks, and then also how you do atomic instructions. So just trying to remember, why is this called PH? Parallel hash. Parallel hash. Yeah, that's, that's it. Parallel hash. Good, good answer. So the parallel hash, we have a hash table with a chains, right, linked lists, basically. So a hash, hash table with chaining, and we are, every entry here has a key and a value, and then we just have a pointer to the next entry. And so the thought is that by using multiple threads, we can increase our performance for doing a series of puts and gets. The pH zero basically just goes through and that's not quite what I wanted. Uh, all right, well, let's, let's just go back in there. All right, so it goes through on a get and runs through the linked list, finds the value, right? And a put will, uh, again, find the right bucket and then do an insert into there. And then our threading will go ahead and each, so this is the entry point for each thread, each thread is going to insert a range of keys and then get all the keys. Right? And as it gets the keys, it um, finds out how many, how many values are there. Right? And there should be as many values as everyone put in. And then here, pthread create. So this is the POSIX thread library. So we have pthread create, we have pthread join, which we, did we already see joining? Yes, we saw joining with forking, right, the waiting. So it's the equivalent of a wait yeah, for forking. Um, and so when you run this, right, with let's say four threads. It puts pretty quickly and it gets there somewhat slower. And we get an error with keys missing. Right, so. Yes. Yep. Uh -huh. Each thread is running independently and is scheduled independently, so it's just the order that we got them. Yep. Okay. Dave? Um, so when I ran this with one thread and then when I made like the different, like when I inserted the locks and then also ran it with one thread, uh -huh. I thought that I got a faster time like after the insertion of the locks. Should that have happened? Before? There is a lot of. Um, randomness and how long it will take. So your best bet is to run five or 10 times and average it. My guess is you'd find, once you added the locks, that it would run slower. Okay, so, so. theoretically it should run slower. Yeah, theoretically, because okay. you're doing more work. Right. It has, I mean, it has okay. yeah, yeah. There's, there's no reason to run faster by adding more instructions to execute. So. Um, and the idea here, right, is you've got these multiple CPUs, right? So 
the threading library takes advantage via the kernel of multiple processors. And so on my machine there, I have four CPUs, and so therefore each CPU can be independently running a thread, right? Wouldn't make things much faster if we had a single CPU system to run multiple threads for this particular example. And then each of them is hitting RAM. So we can have RAM contention, right, of trying to access parts of RAM and where one CPU would be blocked from another CPU. But they each have caches and that kind of helps. The problem is, with PH0, we have no synchronization. So we've got these missing keys, right? And this comes about when we do two puts at the same time. So one thread is running a put five, let's say, and another thread is running a put 10. And in our case, zero, one, two, three, four, five, um, we have exactly five buckets, and so therefore, five and 10 are both gonna hash to zero, because we just do a super simple hash of uh, modulo, the number of buckets. So five and 10 both need to go in here, right? We got a linked list here, and we're gonna have code that's going to you know, set the next value of this, and then set the, this value. One of the threads is trying to set this value to here. One of the threads is trying to set the value here. Who wins? The last one. All right? So what happens? So let's say we've got an old list here. So our old list is these. And let's say put five wins. Oh, sorry. We know 10 points to here and also five points to here, right? Because they're both doing that. And then whoever wins, let's say it's this guy. So put five wins. What happens to put 10? No one points to it, so it's lost. So that's a, a, a race condition is calling that, where the possible ordering could cause incorrect behavior. Notice this doesn't say possible ordering could cause different behavior, okay? The different orderings, if put five and put 10 come in at once and five were first or 10 were second or 10 were first and five were second, those are different behaviors. But if they both are there, we're happy. So a race condition is saying that there's a problem. Okay? There's a problem with the fact that we have multiple threads running together. Oh, come on. Let me emphasize, last, okay, so. When we're writing that pointer in table zero, basically what happens is we read into some temporary, right? These would be the sort of the three instructions. So read into a temporary, we write that temporary into E next, and then we write temp into table zero. Right? You mean I really want this to be correct? Let's see. So we want to write, yes, you are so, so correct, E into table zero. I apologize. That seems better. Does anyone have a problem with that? Okay, so we get the current head, we set E dot next equals head, and then we set table zero equals E. And the problem is which one of these guys write. Right. If this guy's three instructions run before this guy's three instructions, that's fine. That just means five got put in before 10. If these three run before these three, that's okay. 10 got put in before five. But if we run this instruction and then run these instructions and then go back and run these two, we got a problem. Because these three, it's going to be ignored because we're never looking at table zero again, right? We already read table zero and saved it. That's the head of the list. We've lost the fact that now five should be in the list. 
And there are various reorderings that could fail to work here. So a solution is have a lock. Right? So declare a big lock as a mutex. That is, mutex standing for David. I don't know that you necessarily should know this, but do you? <laughs> Drew? Mutex, what does it stand for? I can't write on here. Mutable is mutual exclusion. Mutex. Okay, so that's what a mutex is. So it's going to prevent. It's going to provide exclusive access to some code. And the exclusive access we're going to provide is, in a put, we are going to lock before we insert, and then unlock afterwards. And oh, I know what happened. OK, and in the get, we're going to do the same thing. Lock before we run through the linked list, and then unlock. And Dika. That's like an optimization. Yes, we'll talk about that. So it's a good question. Um, and so when we run, we have basically this big lock. And any time we are reading or writing from this table, we are only doing so if we have the lock. So performance-wise, that should hurt things, right? In fact, we decided it can only make things worse. It might make things worse time-wise, but better correctness-wise which is a reasonable trade-off in this case. Um, and that does work. The problem is that threads are going to get stalled, right? They won't be able to acquire the lock while someone else has the lock. And there's a lot going on in the table. All they're doing is trying to read and write to it. And so therefore, there probably is a lot of contingent for this, for this lock, for this critical section. So a solution to make it quicker is, well, use more than one lock. Make finer grained um, finer grained critical sections. I guess this is how I would describe it. Fin finer grained synchronization. So there, the idea is instead of having one lock, have one lock per bucket. So we'll have a bunch of locks. And in the put, we'll lock the particular bucket that we're working with. And just because Nandico, oh, we still have it in Git. I thought I got rid of it. So do we need it? No, never mind. That's not there. I had a one source file that included all three versions if deft out, and I didn't correctly clean it up. So uh, in the get, we're not going to bother with a lock. And we'll have to look and see why that's OK. So if we did, for instance, we're going to look for correctness here any minute. Yeah, zero keys missing, so that's good. So this pictorial shows it a lock per bucket. The timings that I found are a little surprising. So, and part of it has to do with how this program is written. Commonly, it'd be nice if you know you. This is the ideal for parallelism. If you double the number of processors, you have the time, right? Can you clarify? Like, you yeah. need the array of locks there with one per bucket. How does uh, how does it can you just explain how that exactly Yeah, so here's what will happen. Um, let's say we've got three threads running at once. OK, so we've got a put uh, 
put 5, and I put 10, and we've got a put 13. Okay, all happening. So put 13 is going to take 13 mod 5, so 3, and it's going to take and try and lock or acquire the number 3 lock. No one's using it, it acquires it, it goes full speed. Okay. The put 5 and the put 10, on the other hand, are going to both try and acquire the same lock. Whoever gets there first, it'll go ahead and execute and, and do the put. The other guy will have to wait. Once the put 5 finishes, the put 10 will start. So, so in our previous case, with one big lock, if we have four cores, how many cores can be inserting at the same time? One. Yeah, one. Because they're the guy with the lock. In this case, how many can be doing it with four cores? Four. A uh, hundred cores? <laughs> Where'd you get ten? <laughs> okay, tell me where five comes from. There you go, exactly. Yeah, that's five locks. Okay, so. Um, what was surprising to me is in my measurements, pH 2 was not much better than pH 1. Okay? And I kind of feel like looking more into that because it seems like it should, it should, it should be better. But it's not. Yes, Nandika. Why is pH 0 bigger? Isn't that the one without any locks? It's the one without any locks. It, it, it's the one without any locks. <laughs> Without any locks. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. Let's just look a second. It's the one without any locks. I don't know what the answer to that doesn't make any sense. You're right. The one without any locks should run quicker. Less correctly, but quicker. Five times is when I ran it. There's, there you go. One of them just printed zero missing. The other had to print like four digits missing. <laughs> and so that takes a long time on my machine. I don't know, Sarah. Hmm. But I thought that the way this was working is it was just going through and trying to find every key. But we're using separate chaining, right? We're using separate chaining, but... So if it's not there, you have to go through the entire chain in the bucket that it's supposed to be in, if it's not there, right? Oh, oh, I like that. Let me think about that a second. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. So if we're trying to do... If five got lost, yeah. we're trying to do a get five... Thank you for saving me. So we're trying to do a get five, and it fails in the pH zero case, and that's long because it has to go through the entire chain. Great, great, okay. All right, so atomic operations. Atomic operation is an operation that, well, like an atom, which is supposedly indivisible, or yeah, like a classical atom, which is indivisible, okay? <laughs> Can't be interrupted. Either it completely finishes or it doesn't do anything. Right? So, wait a minute. All or nothing. Okay. Let me give you examples of atomic operation. Loads and stores of a single value are atomic in hardware. Okay. So, if I move 52 into AX, atomic. Or if I move 52 into memory, atomic. However, I used assembly here. Okay? I did not show you C code, like uh, C equals 52. Because we don't actually have a guarantee that that is going to translate into an atomic instruction. C doesn't guarantee that. Okay? And if we have a structure and we do an assignment, that definitely will not be atomic, because this is going to be multiple instructions 
to do the copy. So halfway through this, we could get interrupt and go off and run another thread. And then we've got half of A set to B and half of A as to whatever it used to be. Does that make sense for atomicity? Okay. Does get need a lock? Let's say there's no puts. Okay, you, 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 you run the puts once, and then everything's in there, and then you're just doing gets. Does get need a lock? Giselle. Yeah, it's just reading. If all you're doing is reading, you don't need locks, really. Mutability is, is what really hurts uh, multi-threaded programming. If you have immutable data structures, then life is easy. You just go without locks and away you go. Okay, but if you do have a concurrent put, Katie, you need a lock because? Someone is also trying to write it, so. And give me, the, give me, the, give me where it goes wrong. Okay, so we have a put five, and we'll do a get 10, just so we're hitting the same bucket, okay? Yeah, so if you happen to read before they put, you get the old value, but they're putting a new value, so in, after the put finishes, your value is wrong. Is 10 in the list? Let me ask you that. You want it to not be in the list? Oh. oh you, you can decide. Oh. I mean, are we going to assume 10 is in there or not in there? OK, so if 10 is not. So here's our, here's our 0 bucket. And we've got, let's say, to begin with, you said 10 is in there or not in there? Let's go with not. OK, so we've got 15 and 25. OK? Does that sure. make sense? So what do we want get 10 to return? 15. And what do we want put 5 to do? OK, that's good. So whatever put 5 does, is get 10 going to return no or 0 or whatever we're saying, that it's not there? Yes. It is, because if you think of it, right, the, the, the place that we had a problem was when we set the head, this list to here. So either this is going to point to here, or it's going to point to 10. Now, there is a way you could miswrite, uh, misprogram put so it would fail. Here's the good way. The good way is we create the thing. We write a 5 in here. We point this to here, and we point this to here. And that is a single indivisible operation, an atomic operation, that now splices 5 into the list. Does that make sense? Now let's do the, the, the wrong way. The wrong way is we create this here, and then let's do the first wrong way. Then we set the next pointer, and we set this. So this is 1, and this is 2. And then 3 is we write 5. So that's 3. Why is that a problem? Uh, because depending on when you uh, try to get, you could get the garbage. Exactly, garbage, which might be, in our case, what's the problem if this garbage is 10? But if we do it right, we're OK. And then the third way it can go wrong is if you do this one first, you also have a problem. Can you explain how the first one's an atomic operation? Sure. So let me write the three in order, what we're doing. So we're going to do one, we're going to put a five into it. Two, we're going to write this. That order doesn't really matter. Could be the other way around if we wanted. But three is we're going to do this. Oh, I see. So by connecting it last, then you're ensuring yeah, because we are having it not point at the old and point at the new that is all filled in, and we're good to go. Okay. So if you're careful, you know, you can reduce the amount of locking you need. What if we supported deletes? Brad, would we need? Yeah. Would it be a null pointer? Let's see. So let's say when we do get, it returns us. What does get return or, us? What would be the behavior of delete? 
Let's, let's look at get for a second. Oh, get returns us the entry. Yeah. So you're saying delete is going to delete would delete the, this guy. Would the delete delete like a specific entry or the last entry or like how We'd give a key. Okay. So we'd say delete 5 or delete 10 or delete 15 or something. Uh -huh. So uh, in C, we'd have a problem mm -hmm. because delete is presumably going to free this memory. And so if get returns the memory, then we're, you know, uh, out of luck. And in general, it's not going to be a very good API anyway, because if I do a get and return this, how long do I get to hold on to it? Like one second, five instructions, forever, right? If we had a garbage collected language, then we wouldn't have to worry about that, because the delete could delete it. And yet, since the, it's still being used, it could be referred to. So let's say we have that. We, boom, C with garbage collection. <laughs> Can we support delete? And concurrent get. We know delete is going to need to um, have mutual exclusion with other deletes and with puts, probably. Right? We can't have two simultaneous the deletes or puts or combination of those operating on the same uh, chain. Mm -hmm. But can we have a delete and one or more gets? Instead of with garbage collection? Yeah. Oh, and you... So let's say we've got 5, 10, 15. And we're doing a, I don't know, a get of 15 and a get of 10, and a delete of 10, all at once. <coughs> all right? Get 15 should work, and then get, depending on like whichever. Yeah, what's get 10, what do you want get 10 to return? return 10. If all three of these are running. Uh, um, what, what are you OK with it returning? You're okay with it returning 10, and I want you to be okay with it returning something else, too. I want you to be okay with it returning null, like it's not there, yeah. because this might happen first. Different behaviors, but it's not um, a race condition, because either one's okay. And so the question is, will it work? And I think it'll work, because there's going to basically, delete is going to have an atomic operation where it's going to set this pointer here. Right? And when gets running, it's OK the old way, and it's OK the new way. OK. okay. So how do you ensure that, um, so you said that when you write like a comma of operations, like in assembly, it works for sure the way you expect it to. But in C, you're not sure. If you have a particular compiler, then you can be sure. And in general, if you're dealing with like UN32s, then you're OK. So in practice, uh, we usually do rely on it. But there's nothing in the language that specifically says it. You have to kind of look at what does this compiler for this particular instruction set guarantee. So you can also like, assume that the, like the, the atomic order, like order of the atomic structures are like equal, like equal, like appropriate? The ordering of instructions is a separate issue that I think I have a slide on we'll talk about. Because like, if I feel like, I feel like intuitively, like, the least executed a certain way, then like, that's also going like, to affect whether or not get. Like, if what is executed a certain way? If the lead is executed in like, a certain order, then I feel like there could be a situation where, like, I don't know, the connection to 15 is like, terminated before like, get 15 run kind of thing. The so, like, oh, I see. Oh, remember, remember I said it was garbage collected? So this guy isn't going to, if, if this guy, 15, is, is, is going through the linked list and it's right here when the delete happens? Is that right? Is that what I you're thinking? Like, uh, I was thinking, like, if, 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 I think if, yeah, 15 is, like, on there, and then, like, the delete 10 breaks the connection. Yeah, delete 10 better not break this connection, I guess is what we're saying. Delete better be written in this specific way yeah. that says yeah. someone might be in the middle of using this. Make sure you keep it valid. 
We'd have to write it that way. You're right. That's a good point. We'd, we'd have to write it so that we do this, which I don't know how you could do this other than atomic. But we'd also have to write it such that we don't break this link. And uh, don't change this to garbage, I guess, as well. Right? I mean, don't make this be a 20. I don't know why you would, but don't make it be a 25, because someone might be about to look at it. No, we do have a problem. If, yeah. Because the get of 15 is here, yes. and right then, delete breaks this. Yeah. We're in trouble. Then if you break the other one first, and you do the 5 to 15, yeah. then doesn't your get 10 necessarily like, won't succeed? Get 10? It's perfectly valid for get 10 to not succeed, okay. because we just did a delete. Right. And we don't know the order that this okay. could be in either order. OK, so locks. Uh, we can acquire and we can release. That's what you can do with a lock. If multiple threads call acquire, one gets it, so one just returns, and the other just sits there and blocks until a release happens. Uh, it's common to have lots of different locks. Like we had a bunch of different locks for each bucket. You could have in your kernel different locks for different things. We have a queue for IDE uh, disk commands. And so we can put a lock on that for uh, users of that. But that'll be completely separate from some other critical section we have that requires mutual exclusion. We'll use a different lock. Truth. That is an excellent question. So we are going to look to begin with at spin locks, where it is busy loop, yeah, busy polling. But one can then build up what are called sleep locks, where if you don't acquire the lock, you go to sleep, you know, for th threading. So. Um, but in the kernel, a lot of times, we're having small amounts of code that we want to be protecting with a lock. And so we think it's going to finish pretty quickly. And so therefore, we'll use these spin locks. But we'll talk a little more about that. Uh, and although there are some language constructs that tie locks to data, in general, if you're using locks by themselves, it's, it's up to you to plan how to use those locks. There's no explicit relationship with, um, with the data. So unlike, let's say, how many? Did you guys learn Java? Synchronized? Do you remember the synchronized keyword? So the synchronized keyword <coughs> in a class says that only one method that is synchronized can be executing at a time. Guess how that's implemented? Locks. So there's a lock, and each of them acquires at the beginning and releases it at the end. Okay? So there, it is kind of tied into the language. You don't have to remember to acquire the lock, release the lock, anything else. It just happens. So when do you need a lock? Question number one, do two or more threads touch a memory location? And does at least one thread write? Because if everyone's just looking, it's fine. And if there's just one thread, it can read or write to its heart content. But if there's more than one thread and at least one's writing, then you've got a problem. And this is roughly the answer, OK? But not really the answer. Because, for example, our concurrent gets with puts, in that case, we had more than one thread touching. The get was reading the free list in the uh, bucket. And the put was writing it. And yet, we decided we didn't need a lock. So this is too conservative, because sometimes these races are, are, are fine, deliberate races where we don't end up with what we call a race condition. It's just a not so bad race. And it's also too liberal. Imagine, if you will, I've got account balances for uh, my bank. And so I've got over here uh, my balance, and over here a friend's balance. And I want to transfer money from here to here. Actually, I want to transfer money from here to here. OK? And so I have to decrement here and then increment here. 
Um, this is not the example I want. We are, let me come up with a better example. I don't have an example right off my head, but um, imagine, if you will, a data structure where there are things about it that have to be kept invariant. Um, like the, it's a table, and there are so many items in it. And there's always so many items in it. And so if you add, one of them has to be removed. We might have the situation where it's a, it's a transaction that we need to deal with and protect, where it's do I have a good example actually now. So you want to uh, move a file from here to here. Okay? And there's already an existing file. So we have to remove the old file and then move the new file over to the old file. It's two different memory locations, but we're trying to protect, protect is the atomic operation of doing two things. And so we would need a lock for that. Okay, multiple locks. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, locks, I mean, one thing you often will happen is lost updates. A lot of times, problems of synchronization will just come up with errors or very uncommon, very intermittent errors. You can create these multi step atomic operations. and maintain some sort of invariance. So make sure the invariant is correct at the beginning of your critical section. While you're in your critical section, no one else can interfere. So you can go ahead and temporarily be breaking the invariant and just make sure that it's done before you finish. How many people are familiar with deadlock? Everyone, right? Because you covered that in 1.05. Yes, OK. So. Um, <coughs> That's a problem. It's going to be a problem in kernels. We have to deal with it. So for example, let's say we're renaming a slash f to b slash f. So these are, this is in directory a, and this is in directory b. So we're going to be writing in directory a, because we're removing something. And we're going to be writing in directory b, because we're adding something. And so we need, let's say we have locks for directories. So we acquire the lock for directory A, acquire the lock for directory B, do the moving, and then release those. If, now we've got another thread going on that's doing the opposite, that's moving well, BF to AF or BG to AG or something, it also needs the same locks. And it might naively acquire them in order that it sees them in parameters. And the problem, of course, happens if <coughs> We first, let's say, acquire A here, and then CPU1 acquires B here, and then rate on what happens at 3. Well, CPU wants to acquire B, but <coughs> CPU1 already has B, so then CPU0 yeah. just waits. So this guy waits, and then step 4, because this guy gets to keep going, he tries to acquire A. And then CPU already yeah. has A, so they're both waiting for yeah. the other one. Yep. So. You go, no, 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 after you. No, no, I insist. And they just sit there, do nothing. <laughs> so um, deadlock, if, if you've ever seen real deadlock, it's, I saw it in New York City. So you're at an intersection, OK? And we've got, this is a car. And this car has pulled forward into here. And this car has pulled forward here, right? And this car has pulled forward here. And this car has put forward here. <laughs> there are many limousines in New York. And so they can't make any progress, and they're all stuck in this. Another name for deadlock is deadly embrace, which I think is very poetic. Uh, so how do you fix that? You probably went through some theoretical things of what can produce deadlock. Did you do like the four, the four requirements for deadlock? Does this ring a bell? OK. So, um, and there are some ways to deal with this. One simple way to deal with it uh, that breaks one of the requirements for deadlock 
is an order in which locks are to be acquired. So if everyone uses the same order, you can't get a deadlock. Okay. So for instance, you could use the virtual address of the lock. That would be one possibility, as long as you have an agreed ordering. In the case where we're dealing with directories, we could use lexicographic order, you know, dictionary order. Everyone, everywhere in your system, needs to acquire locks in the same order for this to work. Can be complex. Um, locking can break modularity or can hurt modularity. So you may need to know which functions are going to be acquiring locks to avoid deadlock, for example. So that exposes that already because they're not necessarily just the business of the, uh, of the module. They can be the business of the caller of the module. And so too, ma too much abstraction can make it hard. Um, actually, the takeaway from this is locking is hard. And there are higher level constructs built from locking. Using raw locks is many times not a great solution. Okay. Uh, for performance, locking hurts performance. <coughs> right? Locking, it, the whole point of locking is to prevent parallelism, right? at least in the critical regions. So coming up with the best design is a challenge. For the pH example, do we have no locking? No, because that doesn't work. Do we have one big lock? Do we have lock on every row? Do we have somehow a lock on every entry, possibly? We have to decide that. For disks, do we have locks on directories and files? Do we have locks on disk blocks? What? Um, and in some cases, in order to promote parallelism, you have to make a design change. Like, if you've got a um, f list of um, any free list, let's say. We might, instead of having a single free list that's shared among multiple CPUs, have one free list per CPU so that each CPU can go to its free list without doing any locking. Granularity, simplest thing to do, start big, like we did with one big lock, and then only make it more fine-grained if your measurement tells you you need to. It's just a general rule of thumb, right? It, don't, don't optimize. I had a, I used to work with, he said, you can't optimize too early. And what he liked about that, and what I like about it is, it is unclear what is meant by that, right? Are we saying, you know, it's like you can't run too fast, you, you, sh you should always be able to run, you know, go fast, so should we be optimizing early? Or you can't, like, don't optimize too early. And so this, we're thinking of as the don't optimize too early, okay? Because when you optimize, when you optimize where you think you should, it's often not where your hot spots are in your code. Right? So measure, then optimize. There was the story written of some guy who did some optimization who looked, actually, and measured where his operating system was spending time and then found the code that was doing that and went and like, sped it up by a factor of three. Do you know what he improved? The idle loop, right? when nothing else was happening. That's now running faster. <laughs> Didn't really do much good. Because right? something has to be running when nothing else is happening. And this was before the time you'd power down. Uh, I mentioned like an IDE queue. So here, let's just look at this code. Let's see. So. IDE read write, all right? So we go through, we acquire an IDE lock because we're going to be doing stuff to this queue of things. Actually, we're going to be sending data to the IDE controller um, is one important reason, and the second reason is we're dealing with this queue. So we acquire a lock. IDE start will tell the... Um, We'll send a message to the ID controller to make it actually take this command that we have, you know, read this block or write this block. And then we will wait 
while the flags for that block are What are we saying here? We're basically trying to say it's not. I know what it is. We're done. So we're waiting until we're done. And while we're not done, we sleep. Okay, so this is an example of sleeping, and then something later will wake us up. When we're done, we release the lock. If we look at the interrupt routine, it also acquires the lock. If there's nothing in the queue, it releases the lock and returns. Otherwise, it does some stuff and then wakes up whatever process slept before. Okay. A key is let me come back actually in a second to that example. The way locks are implemented. This Seems like a reasonable way to implement a lock. Acquire is going to go through a loop, so this will spin until it's not locked. And if it's not locked, it'll lock it and break. Aaron. Ashley, are you here? TY. What happens if I've got two pieces of code that are trying to acquire this lock? What can go wrong? So we've got other code here that is checking if lock locked. So let's say you execute this line of code. And now let's say I execute that line of code. And let's say it's not locked. So we're both coming in, it's not locked. You execute that when you check, you see it's not locked. I check, I see it's not locked. And then what do we both do? We both try and change it, and we both go along, and we think there's only one of us, and there are two of us. Not good. And it is very hard, not impossible, but very hard to write a software-only locking mechanism. You really want help from the hardware. x86 has this very handy atomic exchange instruction. So you give it a register and an address, and it will swap the values. All right. So we put 1 into EAX, and then after the exchange, what's in EAX? Whatever used to be in ADDR. And what's in ADDR? One. One. Right. Make sense? So what does it do? It locks adder across all the CPUs. We don't want any other CPUs right into there while we're doing this. And then we read what's in adder. We write e e the register into adder. We finish the swap. And then we unlock the adder. Okay, so that all happens atomically. Yeah, Dave? Uh, not in any great detail. So I believe that there are broadcasts made over the bus so that the other CPUs get this information. So, and then I don't know what, it ha I guess probably what, what might happen, and this is speculation, but what might happen is it will just dump that from the cache. And therefore, it'll need to go out to memory to do it. And I think this guy's locked it on the memory bus, but I'm not 100% sure of that. But it definitely has to make sure that the other cores don't try and access that value from their cache. So the correct way to implement the lock then is we do this exchange. So TY, you and I come in, right? Locked is going to be 0. This is an address, right? And this is going to be the value of a register. So let's say you go first for the exchange. What are you going to get as the value of exchange? Uh, for, oh, from here? Yeah, from here. Zero. 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 And what's the value of locked going to be now? 
one. And then if I try, what am I going to get back? One. One. And what's the value of it going to be afterwards? Like after I'm done? No, after I go, after I do the exchange. You, you got the lock, I agree. You got the lock, and you, you told everyone in the world that you have the lock because this is now one, right? right, right. But what happens when I try it? Like it's still one. Right, so I read one, and I wrote one because I'm exchanging ones. I see. Right? Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So this works because either you take do the exchange first or I do the exchange first. Atomic, nothing, nothing <coughs> missing in between. So have you ever heard the belt suspenders approach? You know, just to make sure your pants don't fall down, you wear a belt and suspenders. But if you want to get rid of the suspenders, I'm okay with that. So, so this okay. is a spin lock. Um, this is a spin lock. When you use, like, posits, things, do you get a spin lock back? You don't. No, you'll get uh, a sleep lock. Yeah, I, posits may have spin locks, I'm not sure. David? Aren't you going to be doing what? Like because like when we're looking at exchange, it says that it writes the value like one and two lock, but then writes lock and two address the password. So we're just going to try to write what was in lock before. But it's not a it's not a point, it's just like a This is an address. Yeah. Right? So what this is going to be do, doing, this is a useful C implementation of this. So it's actually going to take one, put it in here, and return the old ver result, the old value of here, right? You move a constant into one and return the result from the other. Yeah. Really, what it's doing is doing the exchange and returning the result of that register. Right? That's, a, that's, that's what this is, this is doing. Um, T.Y., let's come back to you a second. You got the lock. Yeah. I am still waiting. I'm furiously going through my for loop. <coughs> you done with the lock yet? Uh, I mean, Say yes, please. Yeah, I'm, okay. <laughs> what are you going to do to tell me you're done? You should set it back to zero. Do you have to do an exchange to set it back to zero or anything? Uh, I feel like, no, because inside exchange, you already unlocked the Because So this exchange like function, does it execute the same way that like? Exchange function is basically, compiles directly to the exchange oper uh, um, instruction, yes. Who would unlock at the end when you say you would unlock at the end? Well, let's look at this. We do a release struct lock star lk. Okay? You called acquire, you did your thing, now you're calling a release, what should it do? Okay, does it need to do any exchange or anything, or can it just do this? Uh, I think it can just do that. Yeah, it can just do it. Because basically anyone else is going to be doing these exchanges. And so somewhere, this is going to get interleaved with the exchanges. And as soon as this is zero, I'm real happy. Because the next time I run exchange, what do I get back? Zero. zero. And what's in locked? Uh, one. one. Right. And then I go about my business. So Yep, yep, keep trying as fast as I can. And this instruction gets uh, like stuck in somewhere, and the next time we'll try. Exactly, that's it. And if multiple waiters, right, there's multiple acquirers that are all sitting there calling exchange, one of them is going to go first after the zero, and it's the one that's going to get the lock. Uh, XV6, 
When you call a choir, back up a second. Let's say you did an acquire, okay, in XV6. And then there was an interrupt routine that executed, and it tried to do an acquire. The interrupt routine, and let's say it's a single CPU system, okay? The interrupt routine is gonna keep calling exchange. And this guy is never gonna get any time to go do its thing to release it. So we would have a problem. Therefore, in XV6, what we say is if you're gonna acquire a lock, make sure interrupts are off. And actually, they don't even say that. They say, when we acquire a lock, we're gonna turn off interrupts. And when we release a lock, we're gonna restore the interrupts. So you better have a small critical section because we don't want to turn interrupts for long, off for long periods of time. And it would just be bad, right, if we call an interrupt routine on the same processor that has the lock. Yeah. So what happens if we get interrupts while interrupts are disabled? Can the hardware just kind of stack them up and get them to you after you turn them back on? Uh, yes. Basically what happens is there's a little interrupt thing that's on. And the fetch decode execute cycle is just going to ignore it. It's going to ignore every interrupt except NMI. So you can't disable NMI. So you could just like miss there being two interrupts at the same time instead of one, hypothetically. Uh, yes, but your code is really, you, you want to write your code in response to an interrupt. So some device tells you it wants to talk to you. Talk until it's happy, right? for whatever it's, it's been buffered. NMI stands for non-maskable interrupt. So that's why you can't mask it. Okay. Uh, could you use that to turn off timer interrupts so that you wouldn't have to do something specific? Like that you could just keep all this. You exactly, well, if turning off interrupts were a user, user level accessible, then yeah, you could make sure to keep, that, keep the processor. So that's. <laughs> Ah, spin locks are not, these, this is in particular the kernel. So the XV6 kernels spin locks turn off interrupts. That's a great point. Yeah, otherwise, you could just allocate one of these, go calculate your pi or do whatever you want to do. Oh, no, sorry, go mine your Bitcoin and then, uh, yeah. All right, sorry to keep you over. Uh, I'll be in the lab until 3.30.